Well, you do a lot of things. Sometimes you don't know if it's the right thing to do, but I just thought it was interesting, maybe help uh, the adults or someone when you're teaching to know what's going on. Back in the early days here in this country, when you, the church was trying to be established by just a plain reading of the Bible. We didn't have any uh, one teach us. We, we have it made considering what they went through. They had to read it like it dropped down out of heaven into their lap. So they began to, first of all, get very interested in salvation. They had a preacher by the name of Walter Scott, not the writer from England, but Walter Scott. And he was uh, educated in Glasgow, Scotland, and one of the greatest evangelists anywhere on the western frontier, anywhere in America. And uh, he began to look for words that came before the word salvation. He could see, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That means you have to believe and be baptized before. So he would look at all these words and see the prominent ones and all. But anyway, then this gives you a, a kind of idea on evangelism, how he did it. <clears throat> and many other ways they tried. He would go to the schoolhouse, the school's letting out, catch the little boys and say, hey, come here, I'm going to write a letter. I'm going to write an H here and a B there and an R there, and a C there, and another B on your fingers. They do that, what's that mean? That means how, you get sa how you're saved in the Bible. Believe, repent, confess, uh, and be baptized. He'd go to hear H first. Nevertheless, then he'd say, now you go home and you show your parents and ask them if they know what that means. And if they do it that way, we have a meeting going on and tell them come down and talk to us. So that's where that would come from. But we wonder, and our liberal brethren say, what in the world are y'all doing with those five points of salvation? We, don't, we can turn anywhere in the Bible. You cannot find those five points of salvation. When I went to the school of preaching, one thing I remember, but and it, we had a course called Hermeneutics in a book that explained how people approach the Bible. And they say there's a little bit of cultural difference in the way you approach things to understand them doesn't make any difference. You can understand it either way, but in the East and in the West. Now, the East uh, includes Palestine and all the way over modern-day Turkey and all that. The West starts with uh, Greece and goes all the way, you know, through Rome and Spain and finally over to America. And in the East, the way they would approach things was a little different. They didn't have a logical approach. So to me, I don't know, this is not logical, but nevertheless, it probably is. But they would look at things, the overall story. And you would pick out of that story and just know what to do from reading the story. And then we come to the West, and we have Aristotle, Aristotelian logic, they say, and we want what things, one, two, three, four, five. So Walter Scott did it as any good cultural Western person would. He ferreted them out of there and put one, two, three, four, five. So that's all there is to that. It's just a different way of thinking, writing, but I have no problem understanding it their way. I can see it there. When I, my dad was reading one time and he said, Jerry, you know, according to this, just reading a story, I need to be baptized to be saved. See, he got it without the one, two, three, four, five, but it makes it easier in the West for people to understand, so we accommodate them and do it that way. I was just gonna say also today that if we think about it, this thing called marriage did not accidentally develop as containing very vivid marks of God's character. Certain virtues are best accomplished in his creation of marriage and certain thoughts and concepts also, marriage, divorce, and remarriage, more important than we think. It's part of the character of God, and we fulfill it in our marriages. But speaking of deity, God said, it's, or speaking to deity, he said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help meet or fit, fitting. I will make a man, uh, uh, I will make a mate fitting for him, or meet, M-E-E-T meat for him, Genesis 2.18. After Eve was created, Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman 
because she was taken out of man. Now, when Jesus came, we know very little of his early years, and I think there's reasons for that, but God knows. But we do know this. When the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, that he might redeem them that are under the law. Galatians 4, verse 4. You know that the apostle Paul said, and there's things in this I wish I knew more and understood better, but he said about Jesus, who existing in the form of God, counted not the being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped. The word there in the Greek means to be clung to, retained, held on to, not given up. He counted it not a thing to be grasped, but I don't know what all is involved in this. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death, yea, the death of the cross. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. As a son, he, among many other things, became a preacher. Evangelizo's word there. And Ephesians 2, 17, he became a teacher John 3, 2, and as well, he became the chief shepherd. 1 Peter 5, verse 4. Sometimes in the Bible, it'll talk about shepherds, teachers. Shepherds are teachers. That's their big responsibility there, teach the flock. But as a preacher and as a teacher, he spoke many things, and I kind of like to maybe sometime dwell on the ones, main ones, almost all of them really, that are against human nature. They're against what we really want to do. But immediately, in the Sermon on the Mount, he got down there to something very important and important to us. He said, it hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, maketh her an adulteress. And whosoever shall marry her when she's put away, committeth adultery. Pretty much against human nature, isn't it? Matthew 5, 31 and 32. What is that? If you put away your wife, you make her an adulteress. And if anyone marries her when she's put away, they commit adultery. Well, that's exactly what it says. And it, so how is it that he causeth her to be an adulteress? Usually we say she, in that culture and time, will most likely remarry and commit adultery that way. And so he is the cause of that. We can verify it by that word causeth in the original poel. It means to make, to form, to fashion, produce. Also to be the author of. That man is the author of her fornication or her adultery. And he's the immediate cause of that. Now, we know everything's in general. Some women would escape that. And, but still, that word can be appo uh, translated appointed to, like someone's appointed to death is someone's appointed to uh, fornication or adultery because of that man that did that. In other words, he's the reason she falls. You don't want to do that. And we're talking... I think you know serious business when we talk about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and homosexuality, which the world is glossing over and trying to reverse our thinking on all of that that was once biblically based. But anyway, some may avoid that, and uh, others will not. And so he destines her, though, in general, the person is destined to commit adultery, the woman put away. And Mark shows it goes for the man, too. Either one, it doesn't matter. But notice it again. It hath been said, whosoever shall put away his wife or husband, according to Mark, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, maketh her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Matthew 5, 31 and 32. Two things are very clear in Jesus' statement that he got to very early in his ministry and that needed to be said, and if it ever needed it then, it needs it now in our country. And in Jamaica, by the way, 
we just heard so many times, well, no, I'm not married to him, but he's just not a marrying man, you know? Like, that excuses it. And so they're all uh, living in adultery, and they don't give up. They, some of them do what's right and come out of it. So there are two things that need to be pointed out. She that's innocently put away is not free to just go out and remarry. And if she does go out and marry another, the one she marries commits adultery. Someone might say, well, so? Well, so? Paul said, know ye not, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Uh, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuality, abusers of themselves with men, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, shall inherit the kingdom of God. People that will not listen to God's law, and preachers won't preach it, they'll bear a lot of blame. And elders who did like where Butch Weed went, you know, yeah, we know that there's, we know that that's what the Bible says, and we know there are people out here that are in a wrong marriage, but we're not going to make anything to do about it. We just, it caused too much trouble in the church. So we're just going to turn a blind eye. Well, Butch had to find somewhere else to go where they do what God's Word said about withdrawal of fellowship in cases like that so we go on a little further and God says know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God so then the Jews had another problem they began to try to trap Jesus in their thinking they said on another occasion the Pharisees came to him and said is it lawful to put away your wife for every cause? Burning the beans, whatever, and the Jewish rabbis interpreted, one of them would interpret it as being fornication, the other one said, no, it's just burning the beans or anything. They can put her away, divorce her for everything. So how does Jesus stand on this? They're gonna get him on one side or the other. Jesus uh, said unto them, have you not read? He who made them from the beginning made them male and female and said therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh so that there are no more two but one flesh what God has joined together let not man put asunder well they say unto him why then did Moses command to give her a bill of divorcement and put her away and Jesus said Moses because of the hardness of your heart suffered you to put away your wives. Now that word there in the Greek as well as the English is something against your will. It's not the will of God, but he had to do that. Well, why would he have to do that? Well, there might be some that would do something like run her off and, and say she abandoned him and that would put her under a penalty of death. Or there may be others that would just do like Jezebel do, did and got some worthless people and paid them to say she committed adultery and have her stoned to death. Or you think, oh, well, people don't do that kind of thing. Yeah, there might be a Drew Peterson living back there. It kills one right after another. You know? And then we got the preachers that'll condone that and show that it's really okay. They'll show how you can remarry and remarry and remarry and all of that. But the, the gist of it all is this. Other than death, of course, there is one ground for a divorce and a remarriage, and that's sexual immorality, fornication, includes it all, adultery, bestiality, homosexuality. Except for that, fornication, there's no reason to divorce your wife and marry again without being a guilty party. You know, uh, why I'm preaching on this is, uh, I came here a long time ago, someone said it was a long time ago, and I'm a very young man, I don't know how it could be too long ago, but about 20 years ago, I, I saw them little babies, I was at the hospital of some of you that now have children, and you didn't know it, and I was there, you know, and I saw that, but now your children are growing up, and they need to hear it over and over again, I'm quite thankful HD preaches on it also, he's a preacher that will. But we need to hear that, and these young children need to hear that. You need to hear that, and take it seriously, and teach them. But nevertheless, Barbara and I have tried to do our best on that. So other than death, there's one reason a person might divorce and have a right to remarry, 
and that's if his wife are, was unfaithful and committed adultery or fornication. So I want to mention that. Some argue this, though. Well, okay, we admit it was a sin. What do you do with a sin? You repent of it. And so we, they, I've repented of it, and I'll go on living with my wife. And we have to tell them that, again, and we can show it, uh, I think, one of the quickest ways, if you'll put up with me, is in the Greek, again, Greek has action as well as time. And action's more important in their way of thinking than time. I, I understand maybe God might have put the New Testament in Greek because it's so precise. But when he says, committeth adultery, in the American Standard, maybe the King James, it puts an E-T-H when it's present tense in the Greek because that means committed a continuing action keeps going on. So someone says, well, I, I repent of it. Okay, you repented of it, but it's going to keep going on if you continue to do it. So it's containing a continuing action and it's linear. Committeth means when you remarry, you're going to continue to commit adultery. You may repent, like a lot of people, repent of smoking and go right back to it and become a smoker. So uh, you live in a state of adultery. You have an adulterous marriage. You have an unscriptural marriage. And you live and walk in that. Now people, especially young people, need to get right with God to go to heaven. And if you just think about what this means, you don't like it. And some, days, some of you might dislike it more than others. And it's against human nature because you'd like to have good news and easy things for everybody. But God's word is pretty strict, and it says it just the way we read it. To get with, right with God, you know, someone might come to you someday and say, didn't you listen while you were in church? Well, I was pretty young. I can remember HD preaching on it and all that. Well, didn't you listen to him? You've got an unscriptural marriage now. Now, what are you going to do? You've, to go to heaven, you've got to break it up. Well, what about my children? To go to heaven you have to get out of an unscriptural marriage. Uh, how do you like to go and tell someone that? Could you do it? I tell you, Barbara and I have done it 45 years, and we're still not used to it, and it's still, you just can't, it's like, uh, like that guy was branding a calf, you know, of course his name was John Wayne, after 50 years, I can't get used to that smell. Well, it's just as displeasant and hard. The only reason we do it is we want souls to be saved. And we leave sometimes people, after a Bible study, having to make some serious decisions before they can get right with God. Children often are involved, but people do it. Uh, one thing I might tell you, like one, I preached at Southwest, and uh, they went to the elders as usual, and he told us our marriage isn't right and all this. And the elders said, he's right, it's not. And then they heard the story. And then finally they said, go talk to Jerry and Barbara if you want to. And they did. And the thing is, uh, the, the, the man said something I just, it's hard to understand, but it's true. Maybe, it, I just don't want it to happen to you. He said, I knew that. I was raised in the church. I heard it preached. I knew it, but I didn't care. Now I care. And he had to divorce her, and there were children involved. It's a very difficult thing, so young person, you've heard it. Like Jesus said one time, I've told you before. Matthew 24, verse 25. Some might say, well, we're faithful to each other in a same-sex marriage. Now, I'm bringing this up because it's a little ways into the future still. But that's gonna bear more and more weight as our society gets more and more corrupt. And uh, I think our grandchildren, our children, they're gonna have to deal with that as if it's really something people un understand being true. What's wrong with a same-sex marriage? A ways into the future. The mystery of iniquity is busy and it's working and Satan's working on it right now. Homosexuality, same-sex marriage, is not a marriage. It's what the Bible would call fornication. It's wrong. As a matter of fact, if you ever find out your spouse is committing homosexuality or has, 
That's a reason for a divorce. That's fornication. Homosexuality is fornication. It damns you to eternal torment. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11 that we quoted. Back uh, when I was a boy in high school, I don't know why I can remember some things and other things. I don't know why I do remember them, but I remember the old TV show and the news I used to enjoy watching. It was 15 minutes, and it was NBC, and it was Huntley Brinkley. And Brinkley had a sense of humor a little bit, and he especially liked a U.S. senator, a Republican, by the name of Everett Dirksen. And I watched this on TV, and it, he, he just had to play it back for everyone to see, you know. But anyway, they're saying, you, they, they're saying you did this and that you are such and such and you're supporting such and such. And he said, let me ask you a question. If you call a, tall, a dog's leg or tail a leg, how many legs does that make a dog had, have? And the reporter did reply, you know, we've all heard that, but he did reply, five. And Dirksen did say to everyone's amusement, no, just because you call a dog's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Well, just because you call it a marriage doesn't make it a marriage. I'm as a certain on that. God made them male and female so that they could cleave together and become one flesh. You don't do that with two of the same sex. You may as well claim, go down and claim, well, I'm, I'm married to the ghost of Attila the Hun. Okay, you can say that if you want to, but I don't believe it. I'm married to a statue of Mickey Mouse, okay? If that pleases you, go ahead and tell everybody that. Or someone might say, I'm married to the cutest Tasmanian devil you've ever seen. All right, you can say all kinds, and probably we'll end up where there is. Bestiality is kind of a marriage or something. And they'll say that, but it's not so. Never in God's mind, never in his word, did marriage ever take the definition of being same sex. God defines marriage as in the beginning he made them male and female, this is where marriage comes, and said, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. There's marriage as defined by God and we go with that. And so it's never same sex marriage. I, I really think you'd call it fornication. And profanity is sort of born out of a debased mind. But Jews went on later. The Pharisees had still another problem, and that's a little off the cuff because of our needs today. But uh, what did they say? Jesus said, don't you know what went on in the beginning? And from the beginning it was not so. Well, then they asked him, why then did Moses command to give her a bill of divorcement and put her away? Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. And Jesus said, Moses, because the hardness of your heart suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, this is God talking, God the Son. I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife except for fornication committeth adultery. And he that marrieth her when she's put away committeth adultery. Well, that's God's law on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. A few things need to be said about that. What are they referring to when they said Moses commanded to give a bill of divorcement and put her away? Well, it says in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, when a man taketh a wife and marrieth her, then it shall be if he uh, shall find no favor in his eyes because he has found some unclean thing in her, spiritually unclean, thing in her, something unseemly, then he shall write her a bill of divorcement and put it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her and give her a bill of divorcement in her hand and send her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, who took her to be his wife, the former husband cannot take her again to be his wife after that she is defiled. That's an abomination in the eyes of God. Deuteronomy 24, 1-4. Actually, the scholars, the, the conservative ones, and you look in the Hebrew and all, there's only one command there. She can't go back to her husband. She may do this, she may do that, but when she does remarry, she's defiled. 
Same word used of a harlot and things like that. Well, it seems the Pharisees and Jesus had quite a different view on Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. The Pharisees believed God sanctioned divorce as long as you just uh, write a bill of divorcement so she could have that in her hand. Jesus said, no. God suffered them to do that, write a bill of divorcement. Because their hearts were so hard. So, like I said, he might run her off and... This is trying to save the woman and help her in this life. He might accuse her of adultery. Like Jezebel said, just get some base people and tell them that um, Naboth has cursed God and the, and the king and take him out and stone him to death. He could do something like that. Or, like Drew Peterson, secretly kill her. So, Because of the hardness of your heart, God suffered you to put away your wife. So when he claimed he suffered them, he added this. Yet, from the beginning, it was not so. Now again, if you'll just suffer me for a moment to mention another Greek tense. You can see it in the English, but it's just a little more well-defined in the Greek. It's perfect tense. Now what does that mean? Well, it's something in the past. Well, what's the action? That's the time. What's the action of perfect tense in the Greek? Well, it's something that happened in the past and stands that way right now. Now, again, that nails it down very tightly, and we'll look at that in a moment. He says, was is perfect tense. In the beginning, it was not so, perfect tense. What does that mean? Jesus is saying, in the beginning, it was not so, continued not so all the way through Moses' life in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, and it stands not so right now. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife except for uh, fornication and marry another committeth adultery. Now, the Greek dis uh, grammars describe it quite well. They say perfect tense indicates an action, I'm quoting from a Greek grammar, that took place in the past and the results which have continued right down to the present. So from the beginning, it was not so. Never was so. So they could not put away their wives for every cause. Now it was not in that way in the past. It continued not that way to put away your wife for every cause. And it stands not that way right now. And here it is. Now that we have death and now that we have uh, get past Deuteronomy 24, we, God now thinks that you've had enough. You can have the, the fullness of the, the religion. He's not going to wink at anything among Gentiles or Jews. It's not that way. Never has been that way. Well, we have to believe Jesus on that. The past goes all the way back to Genesis 2.18. It is not good that the man should be alone. And it, I'll make a help meet for him. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And God said, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother. Now something's going to happen, a creation of something, a home. Leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So that there are no more two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So he made them male and female. You know, there's a... Probably many ways. I'm very incomplete without Barbara, my wife. Maybe mentally, maybe emotionally in some ways. Some ways I don't know. And certainly, as far as procreation goes, I'm not total. I'm not a full man. I'm not a full person. I have to cleave to my other half. And we, we really say that right. We're both incomplete without each other. And we have to cleave, I have to cleave to my wife and therefore become one flesh. So we're not whole unless we're married that way as far as many things go and especially procreation. So Jesus says, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. One says this though, well, I had an unscriptural marriage. I'll admit that, but I got baptized and that washed away my sin. So now I'm safe and I can just go on with my marriage because my sin's been done away. No, read the Bible, save your soul. Baptism is for remission of past sins, Acts 2.38. 
It never says anywhere in the Bible that baptism will change a wrong state of living into a right state of living. It never says baptism will reverse a condition that you're in uh, in the previous life. It is never in scripture that it's a free pass then to enable one to walk in sin and to live in sin. There's a difference in a sin and walking in sin. It's continuing action. Well, one might say, you can't live in sin. I've heard it before. You can't walk in sin. And they don't know the Bible. Haven't you read? Why don't you read the Bible? Haven't you read? Paul clearly said, put to death therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, from which things sake cometh the wrath of God upon the sons of disobedience, wherein, now he mentioned fornication, didn't he? Yes. Wherein, these things, wherein you also walked when you lived in them. Colossians 3, 5 through 7. So you're in a state, a condition, a walk, a life of adultery. Our old brethren had a good way to present it. And I don't think we'll ever, I don't care what we come up with, I don't think we'll ever beat this illustration. A man, I'll add a little mophetism to it. It's a dark, stormy night. He goes to another town and he steals a good racehorse and takes it home to his town, his barn, puts it in there. I'll sell it or something later on. But now there was a young lady who wanted him to go to a gospel meeting. And he, liking her, went and heard and was highly impressed by the preacher. Could have been Joe Blue, Joe Warlick, J.D. Tant, some of the old preachers who used to preach in such a way. You wouldn't be sitting in this church building if it were not for them. Nevertheless, he was moved by it, and he obeyed the gospel and was baptized for remission of sins. So a little while later, a brother said, you have that horse in your barn that's stolen, and uh, get, you need to give that back. And he says, I do not. Yes, you need to give it back, or you're a thief, and particularly, you're a horse thief. And he says, no, I'm not. My sin was washed away the other night in water baptism. I'm keeping the horse. Well, you had the sin of theft washed away. But when you make the decision to keep the horse, then you start a walk in a state again as a horse thief. You're a thief. You'll remain a thief until you give the horse back. And baptism won't change that. And baptism won't change a, for, uh, an adulterous marriage into a right marriage. It's parallel. It's the same thing. If, when you keep the horse, you're a thief. Now, do you give it back? You know, one of my teachers, believe it or not, in the school of preaching, and one of my favorite teachers, took the view, no, that's not so. And he wanted to make things a little easier, I suppose, on himself, not having to preach that. And we students argued with him for what it said in the Bible. I had to. And he said, you want to know the difference in, in this analogy you gave and in what the Bible says? The difference is, man's not a horse. You know, I think he meant trivial something like that. Well, that doesn't answer anything. That doesn't answer one thing. He's still a horse thief, and you're still an adulterer, unless you quit what you're doing. You'll remain that way. One more thing that they say since we have another hour. Well, I'll do it fast. We're doing better than I thought. There's what some people call the Pauline privilege. Um, it never was mentioned in church history until after the Protestant Reformation, 1,500 years after Christ. But Paul's answering questions to the Corinthians, and he says to the wife who has a husband that's not a Christian, a husband who's not a believer, and a wife uh, that has a husband that's not a believer, or a husband that has a wife that's not a believer. He says this to him, depart not from her husband. Depart not from your wife. How do you know? You might convert them. And over and over, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, let him not leave her. Let her not leave her husband. Again, 1 Corinthians 7, 12, and 1 Corinthians 7, verse 13. Then in verse 15, he says this, Yet if the unbelieving departeth, let him depart. You're not under bondage in such cases. 
the brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. Now, it does not say, if you care, it doesn't say you're not under bondage to a marriage law. As a matter of fact, the word that's used there, bondage, is doulos. It's a word that is never used in a marriage context. Dulao means slavery. Slavery. Do y'all, y'all think of your marriage like wife's uh, in slavery to you? She's your slave? It's never used in the marriage context. You know, uh, I did have to have a written debate on this. I tried to get some others to do it, and they couldn't. But James Bales kept insisting that I do a written debate with him on it in Thrust Magazine. Nevertheless, I got him to debate some others after I did it. But uh, nevertheless, in doing that, he said, yeah, well, a, a woman has to be in subjection to her husband, so Delilah is okay there. She's not a slave. It never says that. And it's never used anywhere in the Bible that way. It's saying, stay together, stay together. Let him not leave her, let her not leave her. But if they depart, let them depart. You're not under bondage to what? To this dictum, to this explanation, or to this saying that I made, to this law that I gave, to this commandment. You're not under bondage to that. Let them go. But not under. It it doesn't say anything about remarriage. If it's not talking about marriage, then there's no remarriage anyway. So you're not a slave and you can't use that Pauline privilege. Don't men try everything in the world. As a matter of fact, that's a, that's a pretty good indication they don't have a right view. When you find, well, here's, a, here's an idea, here's an idea, here's an idea, here's an idea. And none of them seem to satisfy anyone. It's an indication they're not very strong. We have the truth and we just stop with there. If I could say, and I guess I, I mean it as sincerely as I can. And if you were here and in my shoes, you'd say the same thing. Parents. I really pray that you would take and talk to your children about this. Give serious attention to it. You do not have the opportunity to be a sort of offhand parent. You can't accept this kind of stuff and let them go to hell. Every time I preached on it and uh, the kids were in the car on the way home, they got a second sermon. Barbara just talk to them and talk to them that she didn't want them to go to hell. And I, I don't understand a parent that can't talk to their children about this. Matter of fact, I kind of found out in life, as much as I hate to admit it, religiously, there's nothing I can't say. If it's in the Bible, I'll say it. Uh, give young people, uh, give a prayer for your sister that she will abide by this. And that someday you won't have to tell her you're in an unscriptural marriage. You know that. Maybe it'll work. They may not listen. Uh, Daughter or sister, talk to your little brother. Discuss this. Know it. Make it go down deep. Now, someone says, well, so-and-so says this, so-and-so says that. You can go out right now tonight and you won't have to go more, much more than a stone's throw. And you'll hit preachers who'll tell you anything you want to hear, as long as you don't get mad at them, as long as it's not trouble. They'll preach it like one preacher told the elders at San Marcos when they asked him, what do you believe on marriage, divorce, and remarriage? He really did. Um, Brother Parker told me, and I mentioned this to you before, that the preacher really did say, I can preach it round or flat, whichever way you want it. I, I don't understand things like that. Do you have problems understanding preachers like that? But they'll do it and give me a good job, a salary, and all that. And like Butch Weed went, ran into, and I've seen it so many times, everywhere there's divorce and remarriage taught wrong, you have some cowardly elders. The preacher ought to be fired. No preacher ought to get up here and ever preach that. And then I guess I'm not trying to tell you what to do in the hall. You might say a prayer of thanksgiving for what elders we do have here. They wouldn't put up with it. But we also have a lot of cowardly preachers that try to convince elders this is what you ought to do. There are men pleasers out there galore and they'll shave it and cut it and twist it until seemingly it goes away and good, nobody's mad at me. An elder one time was a jeweler at San Marcos and sent some people to me and see if I'd do their marriage and they had the rings. And I said, yeah, I send them on down. I'll talk to them. First thing out of the box, I, 
I have to always ask, have you either one been married before? I had to ask my brother that. <clears throat> he found out I was a preacher. And of course, I've told you before, uh, I asked him, Ray, has your, this woman, has she ever been married before? I don't know, here, you can talk to her. Oh, right over the phone, stranger, and I had to tell her, and it was true, I had to tell her, no, I can't marry y'all, I'd be doing something against the will of God. It, it would be an unscriptural marriage. He didn't, I, I was kind of glad he didn't persecute me too much over that. She didn't either. My sister did, and her husband, but uh, he didn't. But they'll say anything so someone won't get mad. But the jeweler sent them down there, and I had to sit there in my office in the Bible chair, really, and I explained to them why it's unscriptural marriage. And I've never seen a woman get so mad. Are you telling me my marriage is going to be wrong? Are you telling me, I want it on heat, honey, and I hold it down. Oh, no, are you telling me I'm going to go to hell? Yeah, I had to tell her she was going to hell. He had to get her out of there. And I, w I was glad he did. I was glad he did. Enough is enough. I'd already told him. But another one, Paul said in Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 26, or rather 26, verse 2, he said, You know, wherefore I'm free from the blood of all men. I didn't get that scripture right. Some of y'all better get it right, and I'll say it right. It's Acts 20, verse 26. Wherefore, I'm free from the blood of all men, for I shrank not to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. Well, H.D. and I can feel a little bit like that. We don't know of anyone I haven't told it to that I have an opportunity. But uh, there's a lot of shrinkers out there. Uh, that's a pretty good word, Johnny. You had a good one this morning. Why not? Who's no Webster to tell me what's a word and what's not? I have as much power and authority as he does. Well, and he's dead. He was in 1831. There's a lot of shrinkers out there. What do you want to count? Sometimes silence is good. Sometimes it's just plain cowardly. You need to tell them. Do you know anyone in your family? You got to tell them their soul is going to depend on it, and your soul might depend on what you do about it. Well, there's a lot of ways to lose your soul, and I'm just saying this is one of them. Now, am I seeking to please men or God? If I were still seeking to please men, Paul said, I'd not be a servant of Christ Jesus. That doesn't just go for the preachers. It goes for you. Are you a man pleaser? You're going to let your brothers and sisters go to hell and never teach them? Are you going to let your mom and daddy know they're in an unscriptural marriage and that they're wrong? Well, that's the day and the time, and you've got to make up your mind to do it. Before the good confession, you know, Jesus said there's a lot of ways to lose your soul. Uh, we see that in the Bible, but one is just not obey the gospel. You have to believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, after you've heard the gospel. John 8, verse 24, and repent of all your past sins, and they'll be washed away. The sins will. Acts 2, 38, they'll be remitted or forgiven. Acts 2, 38. Acts 22, verse 16. And then you make that good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's part of it. You confess that. And if you don't, he'll not confess you before his Father who's in heaven. And finally, it does say, if you want to put them in an order, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So you have to be baptized or you go to hell. Now we have a problem with that because people like to follow what their parents believed and some people like to be more theological than biblical and there's many reasons for it. But which comes first, baptism or salvation? You can make a chart like that, by the way, and it's a good teaching chart. Which comes first? You can do that with several passages in the Bible. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I don't see it that way. Well, okay, what if uh, someone told you, Clint told you, you come down to where I work and bring your birth certificate and I'll give you a new car. How many of you are going to take your birth certificate? If there's anyone that would just go down there without the birth certificate, let me know. Oh, no, I, I'd take my birth certificate. I can see that. Well... You can't see the other. He that believeth and baptized shall be saved. We want to help you any way we can. If there's anyone who wants to discuss any of this, you're certainly uh, 
encouraged to do that. We want your life right and we want you to go to heaven. And young people, remember the rest of your life. You don't have to do what Barbara did, but she said she's not going to ever marry anyone that's been married. People lie, and I've been lied to and fallen for it, big time. And they lie about their marriages. So you have to be very careful. I, I, all I can tell you is you need God's help. Joshua and the elders got in trouble with the Gibeonites. They believed them, ate of their food, and they were supposed to be from a far country, and they found out they're right next door, and they should have killed them all. And what does the Bible say? They ask not counsel of Jehovah. You got to do that in, uh, in your marriage. Barbara and I prayed about it uh, before we got married together, knelt and prayed together. You can do that. Not that we're in a, the example for you, but if we can help you all in any way, please come. Mr. Stanley.